All right. This morning, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Exodus, chapter number 28 and verse number 3. Exodus chapter number 28, verse number 3. I want to start reading with verse number 1. Second book of the Pentateuch, written by Moses 3,400 years ago. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me, in the priest's office. And Father, I ask you now, Lord, to be with me, stand with me as I stand for thee and preach your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This message this morning is based upon a simple question. Where are you in Scripture? Have you ever read the Bible as you read along? So many characters in the Bible, so many stories. My goodness gracious. The Bible is a book that spans thousands of years, so much in it. Have you ever been reading the Bible and came upon someone and thought to yourself, my goodness gracious, that's just the way I am. Amen. It's just like me. And in honesty, you'll say that, and in honesty, you'll get an answer. And in honesty, you can be helped. The Bible said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Amen. So the Bible here in the book of Exodus, chapter number uh, 28 uses the word wisdom, wisdom. And it's quite a remarkable context where you find it, wisdom. It has to do with making something. And it has to do with making something that is holy, dedicated to the Lord God. Have you ever thought about the fact that the Ark of the Covenant, that Uzzah put his hand up to touch to keep from falling off of the cart, died right on the spot? And the men of Beth Shemesh, when they looked inside that Ark of the Covenant, Tens of thousands of them died right on the spot. It was such a holy thing, the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, somebody made it. Somebody constructed that Ark of the Covenant. His name was Bezalel. He made it with his own hands. He was a craftsman. But the Bible says that God gave him wisdom to do that. Now, the wisdom not only has to do with the simple fact that he had the talent to do it, but I think it had to do with what he, he understood he was dealing with. And I think you need to understand what the word wisdom means in the Bible. What does wisdom really mean? It doesn't mean that you have an IQ of 160. There's an awful lot of people running around that are members of Mensa that don't know whether they're coming or going. Amen. According to the scripture, they're fools. Oh, they're very intelligent, but that's not wisdom. Amen. Wisdom, then what is it, preacher? How did you define it for me? Tell me what the word wisdom means. The simple, basic meaning of the word wisdom as found in the Bible, means that you see things the way God sees them. You understand them in the revelation that God gives you of them. That you've got the sense about you to receive the revelation from God. When God defines a thing, you don't question Him. When God points it out, you accept it. When God speaks, you listen. Wisdom in the Bible, therefore, marks you and sets you apart from those who may be brighter or smarter intellectually but you rise far above them because you are able to see things in the right way and avoid a lot of tragedy and a lot of problems and a lot of sorrow Amen. and are able to get things done that someone else couldn't get done, that you're able to, uh, to, to talk to people and communicate to people in a way that uh, other people can't. You're able to do it, and you do it because you've got wisdom and wisdom, therefore, in the Bible is a precious, precious commodity indeed. Now, as you read the Word of God, can you find yourself in there where you've got wisdom? That's what I would ask God to give me. If any man lack what? Yeah. Let him ask of God who upbraideth not and giveth to all men liberally. I've been burned enough. 
I've fallen into too many holes. I've been caught up in the wrong place, run with the wrong crowd, paid my dues and my debts because of it. And by the time that you reach my age, dear friend, you should have learned something. You ought to have a little wisdom in your soul. You should be, you should be able to understand things. Even, uh, even uh, one of the brightest men, uh, Einstein, made this statement. Einstein says that it is the height of foolishness to think that you can continue doing the same thing and receive a different result. If you continue doing the same thing, you're going to receive the same result. And some of you are trying to build your life on your past life by the same mistakes you made before, going to the same places you went to, running to the same crowds you ran with, and yet you think that by doing all of that, somehow or another, some miracle's going to take place and your life's going to change for the better. Amen. And it's not. There's no wisdom in that. You need the wisdom of God. So this morning I'm going to talk to you about that. Can you find yourself in a place where you have wisdom? In the book of Exodus chapter number 37 and verse number 1, we read these words. And Bezalel made the ark of, the, of, of Shittim wood. Two cubits and a half was the length of it, a cubit and a half the breadth of it, and a cubit and a half the height of it. And he overlaid it with gold, and on it goes. Talking about what this man, Bezalel, was making. I thought to myself, you know, this is a remarkable thing because here's a man that not only has craftsman skill in order to be able to put it together and make it, he can work with his hands, but he understood what he was doing. He realized that he was crafting something that had never been made on this earth before. He realized that he was touching something with his very hands that no other human being could ever do the same as he had. That for a certain period of time, a window was open and this man was able to do something nobody else could do. So I looked up the meaning of his name. What does that name Bezalel mean? It means in the shadow and protection of God. Oh my goodness. That makes sense, doesn't it? In the shadow and protection of God. Amen. In other words, the good Lord said, now you may make a mistake, Bezalel. It may not work out exactly as you expected. And there may be places in there where you think you could have done it better. But here's the thing. You're under my protection in the shadow of the hand of God. And that's what it comes down to when God calls you to the ministry, when he calls you to work for him, when he calls you to do something for the glory of God. He doesn't expect perfection. All he expects you to do is rely upon him, depend upon him, turn to him, cry out to him, and know that without him that you cannot live or move or have your being. Bezalel crafted that Ark of the Covenant, and it was a beautiful thing. It was a majestic thing, but it was a holy thing. The Ark of the Covenant of God, even today, they make money by making movies about the lost Ark and so forth and so on. And they don't have a clue what the Ark of the Covenant of God is about. The Ark is a holy thing, holy indeed, but it was made by the hands of a frail human being under the protection, under the, under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. Amen. I think sometimes when I get up behind this sacred desk, I know that I'm not a perfect human being. I know that I've got my faults and my problems. I realize that I am no perfect creature, but I know that sometimes that I feel the hand of God on my soul. I know the Holy Ghost is moving in this house. I know that God is blessing his word. I know there's power in here that is not my power. It comes from above. And I say, Lord God, I'm nothing but an instrument in your hands. I'm a messenger that brings your word to the people. And I'm doing what God's called me to do. In a sense, I'm like Bezalel under the shadow of the Almighty. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. And to him, to him belongs all glory and praise and honor. It's not about me, but it's about him. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. The Bible said in the book of Psalm, chapter number 19 and verse number 7. This is a powerful, powerful statement in Scripture. Psalm chapter 19 and verse number 7. The law of the Lord, Jehovah, is perfect, converting the soul. Now watch carefully. And that first part's beautiful. Yes, it is. But look at the second part. 
The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, now watch this, making wise the simple. Amen. Amen. So what does that mean, preacher? Well, I looked up the word simple. What does that word mean? <laughs> it's good to have computers. They're a great help to you. Just click on a word and you've got an instant concordance that pops up. You've got Greek lexicons and Hebrew lexicons and you got all this stuff at your fingertip now. You can do in five minutes what it used to take hours to do. What's that word simple mean, preacher? It means a fool. <laughs> it means a foolish person. It means somebody that's, that's missing something, that they're just plain old stupid that's attached with that. But the Bible says, look carefully at the scripture. Psalm chapter number 19, verse number seven. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. <laughs> you don't have to stay a fool. Yeah. Hallelujah to God. Amen. 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 You might have walked into this house today, the biggest fool in Knoxville, but you can walk out of here today with wisdom in your soul. You don't have to go back to where you came from. You don't have to run with the same crowd. You don't have to keep doing the same things. You can listen to God and let him teach you something that will lift you above human understanding of the natural man who judges everything by his five senses. And if he can't see it, smell it, hear it, touch it, or touch it or taste it, it doesn't exist. It does exist. I'm not flesh. I'm a spirit being that's preaching to you right now and in 30 seconds from now, I could be walking on streets of pure, transparent gold. Amen. That's wisdom, wisdom. The Bible said wisdom is justified of her children. In plain words, if it is truly the wisdom of God, it will continue to perpetuate itself. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter number 25 and verse number three, the name of the man was Nabal, the name of his wife, Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding. That word understanding is the same word that is translated wise in other places in the Old Testament. You gotta watch those translations. Sometimes it'll translate a word one way, translate it another somewhere else. But you go back to the core meaning of what does that word mean? You see, understanding here is Abigail relates to David. She understood that just like Rahab the harlot did, that the hand of God was on David. Just like Rahab understood that the hand of God was on Israel. And Rahab the harlot said, you came up out of Egypt and every nation that stood against you has fallen and they'll never be able to stand and I'm gonna believe the testimony of Jehovah. And she put her house and her life on the line by doing it. And so did Abigail. Abigail said, I know Saul's chasing you everywhere. I know that he's, I know that he's the king, but one day you're gonna sit on the throne of Israel and you're gonna be the king over all this land. She was a wise woman. She believed the testimony of God, but her husband was a fool. Nabal was a fool. I looked up the word though here, fool, as it relates to Nabal in this case, because different words are translated fool in the Old Testament. You know, not just one word, but there's different words translated fool. His word for fool means this, stupid, wicked, foolish, vile. He wasn't much of a man. She was in bad shape, <laughs> married to this kind of a man. But you notice how all these words go together? Stupid, wicked, vile, fool, amen. Are you getting a hold of what I'm saying to you today? Birds of a feather flock together. In other words, if you're gonna live the life of a fool, expect the fact that the people you run with are gonna be fools. And they're gonna be stupid and vile and wicked. And you better not trust them for they'll put a knife in your back in a heartbeat. Yes, Amen. Amen. Have you found yourself yet this morning? Here's another one, he's the wrestler. The wrestler. In the book of Genesis chapter number 32 and verse number 24, we read about the wrestler. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Who is a wrestler? What is a wrestler? What are we talking about, preacher? What does this mean in the book of Genesis as it relates to Jacob here? Well, here's what it means. It means, have you ever tried to make a deal with God? Have you ever run from him? Have you ever argued with him? 
Tell me, dear friend, have you tried to outsmart him? I mean, that's pretty bad. If you ever get to where you've got God outsmarted, my dear friend, you're in bad shape. If you really think in your pea brain that you're going to outsmart that one that made Jupiter, that spoke all this into existence, you're in bad shape. The Bible said the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, beholding the good and the evil. Nothing is hid from the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He searcheth the reins of the heart. He knows what's ticking inside your soul. He understands what makes you tick. He's God Almighty. You're not going to outsmart him. Well, I run from him. Yeah, you can try that too. You buy your ticket and get on the boat and take off, my dear friend. But what happened to Jonah? He didn't get very far, did he? But some of you think, well, I'm going to run from God. Where are you going to run to? The Bible said, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. Where can I go from thy face? When God drove Cain out from the land of, 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 from the Garden of Eden, the Bible said he went to the land of Nod. And then he went out from the face of the Lord. He was going away from God. I'll tell you something, dear friend. Hear me today, please. Are you a wrestler? Is it a constant deal making with God? Is it a constant bargaining with the Lord? That's what Jacob did. Jacob was a deal maker. Oh, could he make deals? Could he make promises? Could he make all kinds of stuff? And he was a usurper. He was a schemer. He got it from his mother. He, I'm going to tell you, go back and read the story about all the family, where they came from out of Syria and Laban and all that. You'll understand that what's mom, what mom, mom like son and on down the line. He was a wrestler. He was wrestling with God. You see, my dear friend there at Peniel, Jacob tried every dirty trick he could think of to overcome God Amen. and they all failed they, every one of them failed Amen. because you know that his brother was waiting for him with 400 men and I'll tell you right now his life had caught up with him are you a wrestler or are you at peace with God Amen. are you at peace with him and have you ever thrown up your hands and surrendered Amen. Amen. I'm tired of the fight <laughs> I'm tired of running. I'm tired of the lies. I'm tired of this false life that I'm living. Lord God, help me. Throw up that flag of surrender. You'll be amazed at what he'll do with you when you put up that surrender flag. Are you a wrestler? The worst thing God could do for you is to leave you to yourself. It is. Leave me alone, God. I'm mad at you. You didn't heal my baby. You didn't heal my husband. didn't heal my wife. You didn't answer my prayer. How am I messed up in this mess I'm in? What happened to me? Where were you, God, when I needed you? And folks get mad at God and never admit it. They're too ashamed to. But deep down in their heart and in their soul, there's a wall that comes between them and God. And they wrestle, and they wrestle, and they wrestle, and they wrestle, and they wrestle. Oh, isn't it wonderful, though, when you can push yourself away from a computer, Amen. and you can look up into the ceiling, yeah. and you can say, glory to God, Amen. I'm glad that I'm saved. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Whoa! Amen. Isn't that something? Amen. I mean, you're in there by yourself, yes, not a soul around, and you just push yourself away, yes. and you raise your hands and say, I love you. Hallelujah Amen. to God. Amen. 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 <laughs> Yeah, buddy. <laughs> I guess I'm tired of these blasted computers. I can't stand, but I've got to use them. <laughs> it's a love-hate relationship. That one-eyed monster's looking at me, and i got to sit there and peck around on a keyboard, and I'm researching this and reading that and this and that, and I look at it and say, I'm so sick of you, I can't stand it. <laughs> and I push myself away and say, glory to God. Yeah. And i got to come back to the thing <laughs> because i got a library in front of me with thousands of volumes. All on a little TV, on a little computer monitor. That's the, that's the conundrum of 2016. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Do you love him? Yes, Have you thrown in the towel? Amen. How many you know what that means, throw the towel in? Remember when I was a boy, I used to watch the Friday night fights. I used to watch the Friday night fights. My grandfather had that television on the Friday night fights. We watch them every Friday night. And every once in a while, you'd see somebody throw the towel in. And what that meant was that my man's not showing up for the next round. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> 
Well, that's what you need to do sometimes. Just throw the towel in. Hey, Amen. Through fighting, I'm done with it. Lord, help me. Just cry out to him, glory to God. Worst thing he could do for you, dear friend, is to leave you to yourself. Amen, amen. Is that you? Are you a wrestler? Then there's somebody in here that I've always loved. I really have. I've loved her. From the first time I ever read about her, I loved her. Who's that preacher? Leah. Leah wasn't one of the most beautiful women in the Bible. No, we've got Rebecca, we've got Rachel, Abigail. The Bible said Abigail was a very beautiful woman. There's nothing against beautiful women. As a matter of fact, the Bible calls attention to this time and time again, how these Hebrew women were beautiful. Sarah, look at her. Abimelech, I mean, he lost it when he saw Sarah. And here's Abraham lying about her when they go down into Egypt because she's so beautiful. And that the first thing Pharaoh wanted to do was take her and put her, make her part of his harem. Sure, that's beautiful. That's fine. That's wonderful. Hallelujah. But Leah was not one of the beautiful women. The Bible said she was tender-eyed. What's that mean, preacher? She had a tender heart. Leah's feelings could be hurt. And God knew it, and God began to bless Leah, and God began to open her womb. And long before Rachel ever had their first child, Leah was having one boy right after another. One right after another. And then she said one time there in the book of Genesis, and boy, first time I ever read it, man, it grabbed my soul. She said, now maybe my husband will love me. Amen. Boy, boy. <laughs> you mean the Bible can't speak to you, it can speak to me. <laughs> man, that was, that was a long time ago. Leah said, now maybe my husband will love me. I've had another child by him. and given him another son. But you see, the Bible said uh, Jacob loved who? That's right. He loved her. But apparently there's nowhere in the Bible that ever said he ever loved Leah. But did you know what the Bible says? You start reading over there in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul is talking about husbands and wives. And he said, husbands. He said, husbands, love your wives. Amen. You say, wait a minute, preacher. That's a willful, volitional. That's a... That's an active thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. You see, a love that will hold a marriage together is much greater than a physical Amen. love. Amen. Oh, yeah. Amen. And it originates with the husband. Amen. Starts with the man. Why the man? Because the man is the priest of the home. He's the home builder. He's the one who holds the home together. The man is the one that God calls on and holds responsible for what goes on inside that house. And the Bible said, Paul spoke and said, Husbands, love your wives. Amen. What do you mean by that, preacher? That means that man has a capacity within him by the power of the Holy Ghost of God for love to rise up out of his soul that he didn't even know was there. Yeah. And that woman, when she sees that real love because God made a woman to receive love, and when she receives that kind of love, she'll return that kind of love. And you talk about putting a marriage together, that'll put a marriage together faster than all the marriage counselors, faster than all the books written about it, faster than everything anybody ever said. The greatest thing that'll put a marriage together is the hand of God. Husbands, love your wives. And you'll discover that you'll, that you'll discover that you'll discover a purer form of love than you've ever known. And then he goes on to say, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Please understand, Christ didn't die for a bunch of pretty people, smell good, uh, dressed up on Sunday morning, uh, stained glass windows, pipe organs, uh, big huge bank account. He didn't die for that. He died for the sorriest low down scum on the face of the earth. Tasted death for every man. While I was yet a sinner, the apostle said, Christ died for me. That's a big truth, folks. That's a deep truth. That's a great truth. What's that mean, preacher? It means that while you were yet committing your sin, Christ died for you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives. Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines. David had many wives and concubines. One of David's sons, Abba Shalom, took one of his concubines to the top of a building and committed fornication with her in front of all of Israel so they'd all know that Absalom had nothing but contempt for his father. Right? Nothing but contempt for his father. 
So David sowed the seeds of Solomon and what he became. But when it comes down to the New Testament scriptures, if a man wants to be a bishop, he's the husband of one wife. One wife. And he's told him in Matthew chapter number 19 when the, when the Sadducees approached him about a woman dying and this and that and so forth and so on. And he, and he said to them, listen, he said it was not so from the beginning. Male and female created he them. One man, one woman. That's what God intended. We messed it up. Amen. How many agree with that? Amen. Now, let me ask you a question. Has a man ever loved you like that, ladies? Has a man ever loved you like that? If he has, you ought to go out of here and say, Lord, God, thank you. <laughs> Woo! Thank you! Said, I've got a man that loves me like that. Did you know that a woman wants to be wanted more than a man wants to be wanted? The Bible said her desire shall be unto her husband. That's the way God made women. I don't care what the National Organization for Women says. I don't care what pop calls. Forget that garbage. What does the Bible say? There is nothing on the face of this earth that opens you up, puts you under the microscope, and tells you what you're made of and what you're like than the Bible. Nothing. Nothing. So, have you ever loved a woman? They even got to a song, a Percy Sledge. What was it, 30, 40, 50, 150 years ago? <laughs> when a man loves a woman. I remember when I was just a teenager, I think it was, somewhere back in there, that came out. When a man loves a woman, he'll do anything for her. He'll compass land and sea. I don't remember all the words, but, but it was to the effect of a man loves a woman. That becomes the focal point of his life and ain't nothing going to stop him. I thought, Percy Sledge, you got it pretty good, son. But that's Bible. That's Bible. Do you love that mother of your children? Somebody said, you know, the greatest thing you can do for your children. Now, listen carefully. This is a big deal. The greatest thing you can do for your children is not the latest toy, not new cars, boats, houses, this, that. The greatest thing, dear brother, that you can do for your children is to love their mother. Don't have it in me, preacher. I didn't ask you if you had it in you. I'm not interested in what's in you. I'm interested in what God says. What's his word say? His word says if you're the sorriest piece of garbage on the face of the earth, you can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. <laughs> Amen. So if the Bible says that you can love your wife, you can love her. Amen. How many agree with that? Some of you are not sure, boy. That's because you've been blown away by pop culture. You live in a superficial, skin-deep, emotional culture. You live in a superficial, skin-deep, emotional culture, has no roots, no foundation, is blown away with the wind. That's why most relationships today won't, last, won't stand the test of time. They won't last. They'll come apart at the seams, and half of the marriages are ending in divorce. It's because we can send a man to the moon, but we can't keep a home together. Right. Now, sometimes you can love a woman and she'll be a Jezebel. She'll be a Jezebel. She won't return that love. She'll be a harlot and away she goes. If that's what happens to you, call on the one that saved you, that made you, and he'll take care of what needs to be done. And the harlot leads us into the last part of the message this morning. A harlot. A prostitute. Did you know that prostitutes are mentioned all over the Bible? The Bible's full of harlots. It's amazing. You get to thinking about stuff like that and digging it and you think, God, my goodness gracious, man. You had temple prostitutes. You had prostitutes that stood by the side of the road with a little shrine. You had prostitutes that, uh, for example, Rahab, she was on the wall. She was a prostitute, folks. Don't make her an innkeeper. She was a prostitute. You got prostitutes all through the Bible. The story I'm about to read to you is about a man whose mother was a prostitute. Turn to the book of Judges, chapter number 11. Judges, 
What was the great characteristic of the time of the judges? Do you remember what the Bible says about the time of the judges? What was it? Somebody saying it. Every man did that which was right in his own sight, his own eyes. In other words, anarchy. Anarchy. Then anarchy. In the book of Judges, chapter 11, and verse number 1, now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor. Let's stop right there. What's that mean? That means he proved himself in battle. That means he was an honorable man. That meant that men respected him. That meant that he was a man among men. That Jephthah was the kind of man that you'd want to have around. That he was the kind of man that you wanted before your sons. You wanted your boys to grow up around men. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 Don't let American culture define what a man is. You want your sons to have men to look up to. And Jephthah was a mighty man of valor. But notice what it says about him. Verse 1. Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of what? An harlot. And Gilead begat Jephthah. All right, now here's the story. Just for the sake of time, I'm just going to give it to you in general sense. Jephthah grew up. His brothers grew up. His brothers were the sons of their father. They were part of the home. They received the inheritance. But Jephthah was illegitimate. So when they reached a certain age, all the brothers got together and said, Jephthah, you're not going to inherit anything in this house out with you. So he left. Jephthah was driven away from his home, his surroundings, the people that he knew. He was driven away. And so the enemy rose up, Ammon. And Israel was constantly in little battles fighting for their land to protect their land. So the Ammonites are gathering in force, and they're about to attack Israel. Their army is at the gates, and the men are worried. They remember one thing, though. They remember that Jephthah was a man of valor. He was courageous, strong. So they went to him. They went to Jephthah, and they said, Now, Jephthah, we want you to come back and lead us because we're in dire straits. We've got a battle before our hand. We need you. We know what you can do. We know that you are a general, and we need you, Jephthah. And Jephthah looked at them and said, hold on a minute. Are you coming for me to come and help you? You drove me away from you, remember? You drove me off. You drove me out into the field. You had nothing to do with me. You cut me off from my inheritance. You put a stigma on me. You blacklisted me. And they said back to Jephthah, yes, but we want you. We have to have you. We need you. You're the only one of all of the people around here that can lead us into battle. Jephthah said, if I do that, what will my relationship be then? What will you do with me? And they said to Jephthah, you come and lead us in battle and we'll put you a leader of all of us. You will be at the top. You will be the man. And you know what Jephthah did? Out of the graciousness of his heart, he said, I'll go. I'll go with you. And he did. He went with them. He led them to battle. And Jephthah, by the grace of God, became the great hero of the day. But there's a lesson in here that even goes a little deeper than that. Now, don't miss this part. Don't miss this part. I want you to turn to the book of Joshua, chapter number 11, verse number 29. <clears throat> Get that in one hand and Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 2 in the other. Now we're going back to the Pentateuch. Deuteronomy chapter number 23 and verse number 2. All right. Deuteronomy 23, 2. All right, now go ahead and read that. Go ahead and read it. Just read it while you're sitting there. Look at that word. You see what he says in Deuteronomy 23? See that? That's talking about entering into the congregation of Israel. That's pretty straight, isn't it? That's tough. That's tough. All right. Now come back to Jephthah. Come back to Jephthah. Judges chapter number 11 and verse 29. 
Judges 11, 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah and Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Amnon. And on it goes. What's your point, preacher? Why, this is the one that wasn't even allowed among the congregation of Israel. This is the one that was driven from the people. This is the one that had no choice in his birth. But he had a choice in the way he lived. He could not choose who his parents were. But he could choose to be a brave and honorable man. <laughs> and when they needed a leader, where did they go? They went to Jephthah. Do you remember Bezalel? Whom baked that Ark of the Covenant under the shadow of the Almighty. God lays the law down in one place, but he's a merciful, gracious God. Yes, hallelujah. He may say that they cannot enter into the congregation of Israel, but I'll tell you right now, I see an exception to that right here, buddy. In plain words, I see it in the sense of, okay, I gave you the law, but my heart's with this man, and he's going to lead you to victory. I'm going to bring him in. I didn't say contradiction. I said exception. The exception proves the world. This preacher will never tell you there's a contradiction in this Bible. I believe it's from Genesis to Revelation. But you got to watch what you're reading and compare Scripture with Scripture. And here's what I found out. All that all fits on Jephthah. He's everything they said he was. But he's also anointed of God. The Spirit of God came upon him. That's what that means in the Old Testament. He was anointed. And because he was anointed, God brought him back in and used him. He used the one with the stigma on him to deliver Israel. He's pointing them way past the law, way past Achan being stoned to death in the valley of Achor with his family. He's pointing them way past into the future when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary and there God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And that's what he did for you. The law condemns you to hell, every one of us. Ever last, I'm condemned to hell by the law in a heartbeat. But the grace of God has reached in and anointed me to preach his word. Now, maybe you were born like Jephthah. Maybe you got the sorriest background. You know how many people are in this country that don't know who their daddy was? Do you know how many people are alive right now that saw their mother do things that they are so embarrassed over? You came up with a good mom and a good dad. God bless you. That's the way it ought to be. And I'm glad for you. But there's a lot that didn't. A lot. And they feel a stigma. They feel a second class citizen. They feel like they're tainted. They feel like there's something wrong with them. They feel a guilt that they carry all of their lives. Listen to me this morning. The grace of God knows no difference. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. Amen. The ground is perfectly level at the foot of the cross. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Yes. And then when you do, you do it, and you love your wife, you'll start a whole new generation where you'll have children that have a mommy and a daddy at home. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And you could be the very one who makes the change right. in the family. Yeah. Amen. 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 Father, in thy name I pray. I've delivered my soul. Father, as Brother Tom Gillum said so well last week, it's not about me, Lord. I wish they'd get their eyes off me and forget I'm even here. It's about thee, Lord, and what you can do for them. Bless them. Receive them by the grace of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up and sing, Brother.